welcome to a new Harry's Garage and today's car is the Alpha 8C composition the only you see behind me. Um, car I've been itching to have a go in again. Um, this car was shown in production form in 2006 at the Paris uh, Motor Show September. It was actually shown as a concept of what Alpha Design could do by, way back in 2003 and back then Alpha was in a bit of a mess. It had 166, it had um, 159, the uh, Alpha Brera Coupe, and it was all a bit of a sea of nothingness and three-star cars back in Evo days. And we all wanted a hero Alpha. And then, 2006 Paris show, they said, yes, we're going to put the 8C into production, and we're going to produce 500 of them. And there was just madness in sale. 1,200 orders piled into Alfa Romeo, and they suddenly had an absolute hit on their hands, partly because of the price. It was €130,000 plus tax, which back in 2006 translated to £111,000. But look at it. You can see why there was this stampede to buy this car. Um, I was tempted as well. But anyway, so it's a car with lots about it, lots of details on it. Let's go and have a closer look. Back in 2006, what Alpha very cleverly did, being part of the Fiat Group, was to borrow a lot of the mechanicals from the Maserati Gran Turismo. At the time, there was just the 4.2 version of the Gran Turismo, but this 8C in, um, got the new 4.7 litre V8 engine with 450 horsepower, and they did. They they created um, an underfloor. The sort of structure of the car is steel underneath. Um, the whole suspension engine and this transaxle. It's got the gearbox at the back transaxle. The, the engines we'll see in a moment is right behind the axle. Um, so it had everything going for it dynamically, uh, and then they clothed it in a carbon fiber panel. It's a part mix actually. So the front nose is resin um, panels, you know, plastic panels, what you will, and the rear bumper is, and under the doors, the rest of it is a is a carbon. And the weight came tumbling down. One of the troubles of the Maserati Gran Turismo is it weighed too much. It was 1,880 kilos. Well, this 8C still a little bit too porky, but it is 1,585 kilos as you see it here. Key thing about the Alpha 8C is just the way it looks. It was everything we wanted an Alpha to look like. It sort of harked back to the history of Alpha, these coup, sexy coupes they used to do, the uh, stunning wheels, and it and it yeah, it just had a presence that we hadn't seen for Alpha for decades. At the time, we were told this was the renaissance of Alfa Romeo, and part of the 8C's job was to herald the return of Alfa to uh, America, to the US market. Didn't quite happen uh, as, as Alfa hoped. They didn't quite have the range, and that, that actually took place several years later when the um, 4C arrived, but that's another story. What we're going to concentrate now is what makes this 8C so special. One slight oddity of this car is this car is labelled as black. This is their black metallic. If you look there, you can sort of see how much colour they put in, a sort of a fleck and a colour, and it really suits the car. And I'm very grateful to the Classic Motor Hub just down the road in Bybury who have lent me this car. They have it up for sale at the moment so I can do this review. Now, inside the 8C, um, completely different to any other Alpha, this beautifully trimmed uh, seats. It's, it's peculiar, it's sort of woven and uh, looks very expensive. And they're carbon seats. I recognise them from the Ferrari Enzo, so they're proper seats. In, and of course, you had the paddle shift gearbox in those days, so aluminium paddles on the, on the steering column and buttons to control the gearbox. Something that was slightly peculiar on this, it had no sort of leather trim on the dash. This is sort of carbon fibre finish, solid uh, finish, and it actually sort of reflected a little bit when we'll see when we go out, but minor details. You just felt very special behind the wheels with the, you know, the aluminium pedals, etc. One thing that was a little bit lacking in the 8C was luggage space. So I've not seen it before, but this particular car has fitted luggage and you've got this sort of parcel shelf at the back. You can put bags in there and we'll have a look when we lift the rear hatch there's another tiny boot there as well anyway let's have a look at the engine 
up the front first thing you see is the sort of carbon weave and a carbon bonnet on the on the bonnet here and then this spectacular v8 engine borrowed well maserati and then we saw it in a ferrari california as well um, you tell the 4.7 liter of this v8 version uh, by the red crackle finish on it and it's set right back into the chassis as you can see there's the struts of the front suspension and it's all the way behind so this is a front mid-engine car um, yeah, great to see. Just see here also, this is the steel structure of this car. So it's like a, think of it like a convertible. It hasn't got the sort of roof structure, but underneath is this steel structure that is unique to this car, shortened wheelbase compared to the Gran Turismo. Um, and then they bolt on the panels onto this steel structure. But it, the main thing is just how far back they got it and how great it is to see that Alfa Romeo badge on this V8 that actually ended up in going into no other Alfa apart from the 8C Spider. Right, let's have a look at the back. Love the design also at the rear, the single lights here and the quad exhaust underneath and the Competizione and the Alfa badge. Really lovely, clean look at the rear. Um, the rear hatch pops on the key and you open it up and you expect to find a great big boot no you don't find a great big boot all you find is a little slot where you have a fitted luggage in this case a little briefcase um, that's all you get behind here so there you go not the most practical cars but what this car is all about is the driving so let's take it outside now Yeah, sense of occasion continues when you get inside. Um, it's all, the funny thing is, I don't know if you can hear, but it's sort of echoing here because it's it's this competizione, this, this solid sort of feel to everything. There's no sort of padding. Even the doors, they were they were uh, carbon fine, like you find on a, on a Scuderia, Ferrari 430 Scuderia or something like that. Same in here. And also, same that you turn the key and it won't start, you press the start button. And it all erupts. And off we go. Um, you're also presented 2006 7 was the period this car was in production, you know, first appeared. So there's a steering wheel that only has no buttons on it, so it's just for steering. And then and when you actually do your first movements to the steering wheel, you think, hang on a minute, power steering's broken. It's really quite heavy, the steering, when you're stationary, which is a bit odd. Um, normal sort of Macwell. It's got auto buttons, but basically a, a car can close just with the buttons, the three um, air vents there, uh, Alpine stereo, HC Competizione, and then you'll recognize these buttons controlling the gearbox from any Ferrari, so reverse, auto, and sport. Um, I have a wet or vehicle, um, switch everything off, traction control, and this lovely badge here saying AC Competition Only 500 Limited Edition. So, right, um, set off. Something I just before we set off, this is the vintage when it has a single plate six speed gearbox. Um, it's an unfortunate era, and it's, it's when you're maneuvering, if I'm here, I just put it in. Uh, touch the paddle, I'm in drive, it takes the handbrake off and it's all good and you move away like normal. Where I select reverse, this car makes some great noises but not in reverse. In reverse you have this constant bleeping whenever you're manoeuvring, just shut up and you can't shut it up. As long as you have reverse pressed you get this sound and woe betide if you ever drive this car without your seat belts on. Oh my goodness, the whole world is coming to an end according to this alpha bleeping and you know flashing etc anyway more to explore in this car let's go out we're gonna head out obviously and go and find out some of my favorite roads 8Cs were notorious of the day for not being the best riding cars uh, in the world it's had a, a peculiar well, slightly stiff setup but then it sort of rolled in the core stuff, so it wasn't quite as sorted. So the previous owner of this, not the current one, the previous one, spent a fortune on this car, um, having it set up with new spring and dampers. Um, the original set had come with the car, but at the moment I'm running on non-standard springs and dampers to improve the ride quality. Well, it's still, it's still not great. Um, it doesn't have, it's not transformed. This, this does feel very much like how I remember previous 8Cs. It's one of those cars, when you get in and you you, you just fall in love with it. Um, let's, let's face facts, it just looks wonderful. 
um, but dynamically it's, it was never across the, the top of the tree. You also, I've got a normal drive at the moment, and you might have noticed me doing my nodding dog impression because the gear changes are quite relaxed. I say, single plate uh, clutch, and it was it was from that time they, they weren't you know we got used to dual clutch transmissions and um, really you know quite sophisticated auto gearboxes in this day and age no it's this automated manual and uh, it's sort of in drive in normal mode like this it's a bit like that the, you're pressing the clutch and someone else is changing gear for you and then the gear comes back in you just you just got to think well it's a manual really um, when you drive around normally yeah most don't notice it. Um, when we get onto a bit more challenging roads, we might mention it again. The other thing about the structure and this carbon construction, quite a lot of road noise coming through. Um, visibility looks so sort of tight with this screen. It's, it's great, really. I mean, it just feels a very personal two seater special car at the moment. But sort of usable, you know, I've got normal instruments laid out. Show me the date, show me it's nine degrees outside. Um, one, I don't think I can go much further without pressing the sport button. Sport gets a little S on the things, and suddenly I have the most tremendous noise to enjoy. It cracks, and you're never going to tire the noise this car makes. And whether you're just getting slightly annoyed at some of the niggles just put it into sport and no, oh, you forget it, not about it. This 4.7 litre engine, we, we saw it appear in the Gran Turismo um, soon after it first appeared in here, so we got used to it. It's an epic engine. Um, it just, it was hampered in Gran Turismo because it was that much heavier in here, this lighter installation of the 8C, and you, it's just more visceral, even louder, and, it's the star turn of this car. The 500 produced, um, only about 40 came to the UK. It was, you know, it was 500 worldwide. There's not many to go round. But then, they, it was a bit strange because obviously they came out with the Spider version. But the price just ballooned up. Um, it was a funny time with the market of AC. Obviously, there was a lot of demand when it first came out, and there was premiums being paid. Because actually, 100 and in UK, 111,000 pounds was not a lot for this very special car that just looked ace. But then the Spider, they got a bit greedy with it. And the UK, when that appeared in 2009, they jacked the price up to 174,000 pounds, so an increase of 64,000, which was a tad greedy. And surprise, surprise, they didn't manage to sell them all. And um, well, they sort of got quietly off. They sort of said they're all sold, but but buyers balked at the price. And I, uh, they then got offered on quietly on deals. Never advertised at dealers, but a friend of mine bought one. I think he paid about 120,000 for it. It's all pre-registered. Um, so it, the market quietened down. Now it's very different they are in demand people recognize this is a very special car and i think that, i mean this car is up for two hundred and twenty-five thousand pounds so a real save a change double the price it was new in 2007 although this car was actually registered in 2009. lovely that constant reminder of the v8 bourbon in a way It rev to revs to seven and a half thousand rpm. Get the 450 horsepower, 354 pounds of torque. Um, that four and a half thousand rpm. So not the torque is of unit, but actually in this lighter weight, it feels pretty energetic. And I just you know was looking for doing this test, and I saw that Road and Track actually once figured an 8C, and it um, managed to get to 0 to 100 miles an hour in 9.3 seconds, which is well, it's pretty good going. 12.4 for the standing quarter, something like that. So yeah, pretty quick really. Here on the dash, what have we got? We've got electric windows, central locking, uh, part brake, open the back, very little really. Um, which I think, yeah, just single Bose speakers in the back and then there as well. I do like the fitted luggage and it's a 
and this strange trim you've got on the AC this very ornate um, sort of leather trim I think they're trying to hark back to a if you have a, have a look at an Alpha um, 1750, a GTV, they had quite a strange trim on them. I think this is to hark back to those times. Sort of plaited, good look. I like the door handles as well. They feel cold to touch. They're proper metal and this grip, I just, you know, never, this grip on the, um, on the dash, it's very like the F-type. So, you know, first time we saw it was, I suppose, was on here. Yeah, nice thing. See, it goes to this default mode as soon as you turn it on, this sort of auto mode. If I press auto, I get manual slightly for us, but um, we are an Italian car, logic doesn't always play a part. And then I've got a lovely sprint up a hill here and just coming out of a 30 zone. So I have dropped the revs, I'm in second gear, and I am doing, what am I doing? 30 miles an hour, so can't be hard. It isn't great in this, but um, the, it's just see right there. Here we go. Oh, yes. Yeah, it's quite a riot of noise when you do a launch in first. Traction isn't all it should be. It feels quite pointy, it's quite quick steering, but it feels up on tippy toes. It's a funny feeling with the AC. You never quite feel keyed in to the surface. After these suspension pods, that's sort of the same with this car. Right there. Why does it take off there? It's some pause. Yeah, it's doing slightly strange things. It's the trouble with the AC. It, it's sort of, I remember in back in period getting first drive, you said, Oh, it must have been a robot, but get another one in. Dynamically, it's not polished and it's you almost can't understand it because it's got all those ingredients, it's got that engine tucked in, it's got Maserati Ferrari heritage, trans axle gearbox of the weighting, you know, split front rear is perfect. Why oh, isn't it dynamically brilliant? It's one of those cars you'll very rarely see on a track day because it because the, the um, owners are slightly intimidated. It's not a full-on negative, it's not a recommendation not to buy this car, own one if you want one, because it's so drop-dead gorgeous, it's just not quite as polished dynamically as it really should be. That's not what it's about, whatever it says on the menu. I should say the brakes aren't the strongest, it's one of those cars that really benefited from carbon discs or something. Do have a tendency to sort of go off and slightly mushy pedal. We're so spoiled with the gearboxes we get these days, the dual clutch transmission, almost instantaneous changes. Um, back here, back at this age of car, we have a single plate clutch automated manual. The speed of the change on this car is 200 milliseconds. What's that mean? Well, to give you a reference, 430 Scuderia, which was out about the same sort of time, was 60 milliseconds. So the Ferrari changed three times as quick as this. You sort of get used to it. I own the Gran Turismo of this gearbox, and it's initially you think, oh, it's not very good. It's especially not good at manoeuvring, reverse, going forward, turning, going up a ramp into a car park, or something like that. There, it really feels clumsy. Out on a road like this, it's just not quite as quick as you'd like it, but after a few weeks, you sort of forget about it. There's so much more to enjoy about this car. It's just the gearbox isn't the greatest. I think if I owned this, I'd actually put it back to a standard suspension setup. It's not quite right on this particularly lumpy uh, B road. That's why I use this road a lot, because it's quite, it will sort any chassis out. I can't quite nail it out. 
just haven't quite got that confidence and it, I've just noticed it's running out of travel, which is never a good feeling over the bumps, it just locks out when it shouldn't be. Oh dear. We've got to think about this car at that price point now, it's broken into the 200s. There's some quite tasty cars at that sort of price point. Well, you can save a lot of money and buy yourself a Ferrari 599. But that feels a bigger car than this. Yes, it's got the V12, it's very angry down the road. Also intimidating to drive really fast, but pretty special. 458 Speciale, another 20,000 pound on top of this will get you a 458 Speciale. Oh, I wouldn't want to say no to one of those at all. Um, but then again, they've built in much bigger numbers than this, so you've got 500 of this. Tough call between the two. Wonderful to revisit though. A very special car by Alfa Romeo, this thing. Ten years on, it doesn't disappoint, doesn't disappoint in the looks department, etc. My recommendation would actually be just lock it away when it's wet and cold, lock it away and just look at it, put it on the metal, polish it and bring it out for those special sunny days or the trip across Europe. You just have to pack a bit light, that's the only trouble. But yeah, fabulous car, um, great as it exists and uh, I've really enjoyed getting to know it again. I hope you enjoyed this video, if you have, keep watching, 